Let's talk to Cornelia Meyer, who's the CEO of MRL Corporation, which is a business consultancy. Welcome, Cornelia. Morning, Cornelia. Lovely Good to see morning. you. Good morning. Now, tapering. You're going to have to explain why tapering is affecting the emerging world. Well, if you have tapering, that will mean eventually also interest rates will go up again. This is again action by in, the Federal Reserve, in, Federal isn't Reserve it? in OECD economies, and then is also a sign that OECD economies, especially US economy, is stronger, so they can taper. So you will see money go out of emerging markets into um, the safer emerged economies because it is um, it is safe and you get better returns again right now you needed to go for the returns and especially the countries with um, huge current account deficits are the ones that are most at risk and there you know you look at current account deficit and your foreign currency reserves, which gives you sort of a good, good, good grasp of how you can meet your short-term liabilities as a country, and especially Turkey and um, uh, Chile, Indonesia, India, and South Africa are the ones who are sort of most affected by that. Are you concerned about this? I mean, the reason this article is in the FT today is because it's been digging deep into the World Bank. Uh, report that was out yesterday which is looking ahead to the year and the the World Bank report says that uh, financial flows to developing countries could go down by 80% I'm and that's quite significant yeah, isn't I'm it? absolutely concerned because we saw when when um, um, Ben Bernanke the former Fed chairman said well we will start um, taper soon in May last year you suddenly saw countries such as Turkey um, and Indonesia and India really have lots of money going out so what you saw essentially was a a whole load of money swishing out of emerging markets back to emerged economies and as the tapering didn't happen go back into emerged uh, into the emerging markets it is a problem also just to be clear um, they've mentioned ukraine venezuela venezuela and Argentina also is potentially being at risk, but there are concerns about their domestic problems exactly, as well. Exactly, yes, because so they are, the countries aren't strong enough. The countries aren't strong enough, and they've had really horrible, horrible domestic economic policies. So, um, uh, sort of, basically, all hope is lost. No. Right. That sounds a bit grim, doesn't it? Does. It? I, hope you're, I hope you're wrong there, Cornelia. <laughs> Finance Minister Osborne, or Chancellor, as he's known here, warns of quitting the EU unless its treaties are altered. Well, Tough I, talk. Uh, I would say it's, it is. He's appeasing the hardliners in his party, in the in the Conservative Party, um, and and you know there's an e, there's an EU um, parliamentary election coming up, and the very right wing UKIP anti anti EU party is 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 bound to make inroads. So that's tough talk. But you know, really, if you look at the substance of it, do you really want to um, cut off your no nose despite your face? We so are so dependent on having access to the European market in terms of our exports. This is our biggest trading partner, the EU. We can really ill afford this tough talk. I mean, in, in the article, it talks about the fact that what he's saying is probably falling on deaf ears in Brussels, because this is the kind of stance we've heard from the Conservative Party ever since we joined, pretty much. Yeah, isn't ab it? Absolutely. And, you know, um, um, Cameron, our Prime Minister, came out with this ill-fated um, attempt last um, January, actually a year ago, where he said, well, you know, when I'm re-elected, I will go and negotiate and then put everything up for a referendum, which really, uh, this sort of uncertainty, the EU has other problems right now than, than, than Britain sort of acting up as a spoiled child. This is a bit harsh of me, but maybe... Well, well, you're allowed to be harsh. You're allowed to be harsh. Um, let's talk. I want to find out about you because we're looking at the South <laughs> China Morning Post. Tell us more, Cornelia. <laughs> yes. Are, do you hold dual citizenship? I do hold dual citizenship. Um, Switzerland and Britain. Okay. I'm very proud to be British, I have we, to we say. Know that. We know that. So, very vocal about that on this paper review. So you are the perfect person to explain what's going on. Firstly, the South China Morning Post is picking up on a story related to Canada. Canadian yeah. dual citizens. And I think it's a very slippery road because it, you, what you do is you effectively are creating uh, two, two um, citizen statuses. One is the dual citizen, one is the non-dual citizen, and then they say, well, are, are they paying taxes? Are they resident? Are they not what resident? What are they proposing, though, in Canada with regard to the dual citizen? 
Because we haven't explained that yet. Oh yes, they're proposing that if you're a dual citizen and you don't live, you're not resident in Canada and you don't pay taxes in Canada, we will not help you um, as, as our consular services will not be um, available to you. And that is really a, that is really very, very difficult. You know, you may you may your job may take you somewhere else. And if you are if you hold that passport, you will want to be helped by your consular services. And, and South China Morning Post, they're focusing on it because they've got 300,000 Canadians living in Hong Kong uh, right now. There's quite a few of them in London as well. And it's whose responsibility? Absolutely. And, and the thing is, if you're a dual citizen, suddenly if all countries do that, suddenly nobody's responsible for you anymore and you're left to rot somewhere. That's a horrible thought. <laughs> Interesting. We should keep an eye on that one. Mm. We, um, talking, we've spoken about David Cameron. Let's go to the other party, the Labour Party. Ed Miliband has been rebuked by the Governor of the Bank of England. Should the Governor of the Bank of England be rebuking a politician I in think, public? I think it's a... And why? Why has he rebuked well, him? Well, he rebuked him for two reasons. Ed Miliband said we need to break up um, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, we need to you know, get more of the branches to other banks so there's less of a monopoly, more competition. And rightly, Kearney said, you know, more banks doesn't necessarily mean more competition. And also, you know, we want good banks. Look what happened to Lloyd's TSB when they were supposed to sell 500 odd branches to the Coa Bank last September and that couldn't go through because the Coa Bank wasn't, um, it wasn't liquid enough to, to really do that deal. So, um, so there he has a point and then he was rebuked because Miliband said well you know especially in the Royal Bank of Scotland which is essentially state owned um, we, don't, we don't want more than two times some um, bonuses and that's where he rebuked as well. In defense of Mr. Carney, he's sort of the, the super um, central banker because he's also head of the International Stability Board. So he's, he's sort of the central banker of central bankers. However, it's again, I hate that word, but it's, it's a slippery slope. If you go out and criticize people in public, you need to be very aware that they may then come back and criticize you once you make your first mistake. Just to say that it's in his speech tomorrow that uh, Ed Miliband will outline the Labour Party's plans in terms of bringing in more competition to the, the big five I'm, I'm in the UK. I'm for competition, but we really have to be very careful because we want good banks. What got us into problem was, was, was banks that were not, you know, were not able to meet their commitments. And with the bonuses, I really understand what he, you know, wh where he's coming from. We've got about a minute and a half. Let's whiz through Spain um, as a main, its main energy source in 2013 was wind. Are you surprised? Um, I'm surprised, but you know, it's a little bit, if you look at it, it's 20.8% is wind, 20.9% is wind, 20.8% is nuclear, and so then 14.4% the difference. Yes, so it's, it's a little bit, yeah, it's but a little it's bit. Symbolic, it's, it's symbolic, isn't it? It's symbolic, they're moving in the right direction. It's symbolic, but, you, but what they have is they have good base loaders because wind is an intermittent source of energy. Nuclear is a base load, it always emits. And then they have a lot of hydro. Hydro is something that always emit so you you need to make sure when you have these wind and solar that you have good base loaders international new york times uh, very briefly uh, cornelia israel takes steps to ban the word nazi what exactly are they proposing here oh they want they want to to ban it it, it can only be used if you really refer, refer to nazis of the third reich and banning is so maybe no other context no other context banning may be a little bit strong but Thinking about when you use such laden words as Nazi may, for all of us, I have used it in the wrong context, not be a bad thing. Yeah, but just, just to be a little bit more mindful when we're talking. Yeah. You're always mindful <laughs> when you talk to us. Thank you so much, Cornelia. You. Cornelia Meyer. We Sally have to be and I, very, very mindful. We do. We? <laughs> Sally and I will see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>